I want to start by asking you guys a question. How many of you have had to fill out some sort of web form where you've been asked to read a distorted sequence of characters like this one or a distorted word like this one? Excellent. How many of you really, really hated doing that? Excellent. I invented that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so that thing is called a CAPTCHA, and the reason is there is to make sure that you, the entity filling out the form, are actually a human and not a computer program that was written to submit the form millions of times. And the reason it works is because humans can read these distorted squiggly characters, whereas computer programs can't do it as well yet. So, for example, in the case of Ticketmaster, or in the case of, uh, yeah, in the case of Ticketmaster, for example, the reason you have to type these is to prevent people from writing scalpers, ticket scalpers, ticket resellers, from writing a program that can buy millions of tickets kind of two at a time. Okay? Now, this is used all over the internet. Uh, it turns out that approximately 200 million times a day, somebody types one of these. Now, when I first heard this number, I was quite proud of myself. I thought, look at the impact that my work has had. Uh, but then I started feeling bad, because pretty much everybody finds them annoying. And not only that, if you multiply 200 million by 10 seconds, it takes about 10 seconds to type one of these. If you multiply 200 million by 10 seconds, you get that humanity as a whole is wasting about 500,000 hours every day typing these annoying captures <laughs> because of me. So I started feeling bad. Um, and I started thinking, is there any way in which we can use this effort for something that is good for humanity? See, here's the thing. During those 10 seconds while you're typing one of these, your brain is doing something amazing. Your brain is doing something that computers cannot yet do. So the question is, can we get you to do something useful? And the answer to that was yes, and this is what we started doing. So the original CAPTCHA project was done uh, in the year around 2000, 2001. Uh, a few years later, um, we started doing the following. And we changed CAPTCHA. This is a new project that I started. It's called ReCAPTCHA. It's kind of the second round of CAPTCHAs, where the idea is that as people are typing a CAPTCHA, not only are they authenticating themselves as a human, but they're also helping us to digitize books. So let me explain how that works. So there's a lot of projects out there trying to digitize books. The idea is to take all of the books that have ever been written in physical form and put them on the internet, easily accessible to everybody. Now, the way this process works is you start with a book. You've seen those things, right? Like a, like a book. Okay, so you start with a book, and then you scan it. Now, scanning a book is like taking a digital photograph of every page of the book. It gives you an image for every page of the book. Now, these are images. These are basically pictures of text. Now, the next step of the process is that the computer needs to be able to decipher all of the words in these pictures. But the problem is that for older books, where the ink has faded and the pages have turned yellow, the computer cannot recognize many of the words. But humans can. So what we started doing is we started taking all of the words that the computer cannot recognize, and we're starting, we started to get people to read them for us while they type CAPTCHAs on the internet. Okay, so next time you type a CAPTCHA, those words that you're typing are actually words that are coming from books that are being digitized that the computer could not recognize, and we're getting people to read them for us. Okay. Thank you. So we're basically using what people are entering in order to help digitize books. Now, some of you may be wondering, a key question. Wait a second. This is a word that the computer just got out of a book. It doesn't know what it is, and we're going to give it to a human. How do we know whether they type the correct answer or not? And this still needs to be a test to distinguish humans from computers. So the way we know is actually this is why sometimes you see two words as opposed to one. So the idea is that when you see these two words, one word is a word that, it just, that just came out of a book. The computer doesn't know what it is, and it's going to give it to a people. The other word is a word that we already figured out what it is. We, the system already knows the answer. Now we're going to give people these two words. We're not going to tell them which one's which. We're just going to say, please type both. And if they type the correct word for, what, for the one for which the system already knew the answer, then the system assumes that the user is a human. And then they, it also gets some confidence that they typed the other word correctly. And if we repeat this process to like 10 different people and they all agree on what the new word is, then one more word becomes digitized. So that's how the whole process works. This has been a very successful process. Um, this, this actually turned into a company. It was acquired by Google in 2009, and by now it's digitizing on the order of about 100 million words a day, which is the equivalent of about 2 million books a year, all being digitized one word at a time by just having people type captures on the internet. Now, thank you. Now, um, because 
we are giving out so many of these words and now we give two randomly chosen English words right next to each other. Most of these are in English that are being given out. Funny things can happen. Uh, so let me give you a couple of examples. So this is, this is one. Um, this is the word Christians. There's nothing wrong with it. But if you put it along with another randomly chosen word right next to it, bad things can happen. So we showed this, for example. Uh, but it's even worse because this system is used in literally millions of websites. The particular website where we show this happened to be called the Embassy of the Kingdom of God. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Here's another. This, this next one is pretty old. This was a U.S. politician, JohnEdwards.com. <laughs> so we keep insulting people left and right all day long. Um, now, let me talk to you about the, the main project that I wanted to talk to you about. Um, this, is, this is a project called Duolingo. It's, it's something that started about five years ago. Uh, I was in a very fortunate position in my life. I had just sold my second company to Google, which was this book digitization deal. Um, and I, I didn't really have to work anymore. In fact, I retired. That lasted about two weeks, uh, my retirement. And then I got bored. Uh, and then I started thinking, you know, what should I do next? What, what project should I work on next? And what I wanted to work on was something that was related to education. I've always had a passion for education. I am a professor, after all. So I wanted to do something related to education. But my views on education are very influenced by where I'm from. I am from Guatemala. So this is a public service announcement. That is where Guatemala is, by the way. Uh, and just a very important note, this is not where they keep the prisoners. That's called Guantanamo. <laughs> not the same. Now, Guatemala is a, is a very poor country. And a lot of people talk about education as something that brings equality to different social classes. But I always saw it as the opposite, as something that brings inequality. Because what happens in practice, especially in poor countries like Guatemala, is that people who have a lot of money can buy themselves the best education in the world. And because of that, they continue having a lot of money. Whereas people who don't have very much money barely learn how to read and write. And because of that, they can never really make a lot of money. So I always saw education as something that brought inequality to different social classes. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to do something that would give e equal access to education to everybody, regardless of their socioeconomic class. Now, education is very general, uh, so I decided to concentrate on just one aspect of education, which happens to be a huge aspect, uh, or a huge thing that people learn, and it is learning a foreign language. So it turns out there's 1.2 billion people in the world learning a foreign language. This is huge everywhere in the world, except the United States, people don't really learn another language in the US, but everywhere else is very big. Um, now, this is a very interesting market. Out of these 1.2 billion people, 800 million, so two-thirds of them, satisfy three properties. First, they're learning English. Second, the reason they're learning English is to get a job or to get a better job. And third, they are of low socioeconomic conditions. Okay, so most people learning a foreign language are basically doing so in order to learn English to get out of poverty. Now, ironically, before Duolingo, most of the ways there were to learn another language, especially with software, were very expensive. For example, in the US, there was a software called Rosetta Stone, which was between $500 and $1,000. In, in Latin America, there was another thing called Open English, which was about $1,000. So the irony of it all was, it seemed like most people were trying to learn a language to get out of poverty, but you needed $1,000 in order to get out of poverty. So this kind of made no sense. So what I decided to do with my co-founder, Severin, is that we decided to launch a completely 100% free way to learn a language. And that was Duolingo. So we launched it about four and a half years ago. And since then, it has grown a lot. Um, by now, Duolingo is the most popular way to learn languages in the world. We have a lot of kind of interesting statistics about it. For example, there are more people learning a foreign language on Duolingo in the United States than there are people learning a foreign language in the whole US public school system. Um, and here's another interesting one. Uh, um, we teach a lot of languages. We don't just teach English. We teach all kinds of languages. Um, we teach some, some of the larger languages that you would imagine, English, Spanish, etc. But we also teach the smaller languages. For example, we teach Irish. I actually, I will confess, I didn't know Irish was a language. Uh, I thought they spoke English in Ireland, which they do. Uh, but they also speak Irish. Some small number of people speak Irish. It turns out there are 94,000 native speakers of Irish. On Duolingo, we have one million people learning Irish. So we can actually multiply the number of speakers by 10. And because of that, we actually just a couple of months ago, uh, we got an award from the Irish president uh, because of this. Now, if you have never seen a picture of the Irish president, I, I encourage you to look at one. Um, here's him in the middle. Uh, <laughs> I am not joking. This is the Irish president and the other people are people that work for Duolingo. Uh, that wasn't supposed to be that funny, but OK. <laughs> um, now, 
people say, uh, you know, uh, why do people like Duolingo so much? Um, so there are some of the things that people say. So for example, this person says in the past two days they've learned more from Duolingo than in four years of high school. Now I think that says more about high school than about Duolingo. Duolingo is not that good. Um, or here's this other person. That was my mother. <laughs> she likes it. Uh, now, one of the reasons that people like Duolingo so much uh, is because it's, it's very easy to learn with it and it really feels like you're playing a game. We've basically spent a lot of effort trying to make Duolingo feel like you're playing a game. So, there's, by the way, you can access it on a website, on an app, there's an iPhone app, an Android app, etc. This is what it looks like on the iPhone. Um, and the idea is that we split up the language into multiple units. Uh, so some of the units, for example, are one of them is food. That's where you learn anything about food, how to order food or uh, all the different food words. Another one is animals, you learn all the names of the animals. Another one is plurals, you, know, you learn how to pluralize different words. And the idea is that at the beginning only one of the units is unlocked. And then you have to complete that unit to unlock other ones. So there's basically this unlocking mechanism, which is very similar to a game. And inside each of these units, uh, the, the way you learn is you learn with these little mini exercises. You're never having to read grammar lessons or anything like that. You're always doing something. You're always doing something actively. So for example, in some of the exercises, you may have to translate what you see. In other ones, you may have to click, you know, tap on the image that is, that is related to the word to learn vocabulary. In other exercises, you may have to speak to the app and it tells you whether you said it correctly or not. And at any point in time, uh, uh, when you get something right, you get closer to finishing a lesson, and when you get something wrong, you kind of go back a little bit. So there is this, this progress bar at the top of each lesson. It starts out empty. Whenever you get something right, it goes up. Whenever you get something wrong, it goes down. And we actually have a lot of intelligence in this program that many of the users don't realize. So when you start a lesson, that lesson is actually completely tailored to you. We know all the things that you've gotten right and wrong when you've used Duolingo. So for example, we've know, we know that you get the word for elephant wrong every time. So we, we tailor a lesson, we give you more examples of elephants, elephants so that you learn that better. And we also have an idea, thank you, that's good. <laughs> um, we also have a pretty good idea about how much each user knows. So we know all the things you've gotten. So we, we, we know basically how much each user knows. And then when we give them an exercise, we have a pretty good idea of whether, whether they're going to get it right or wrong. And some of the exercises that we give on purpose, we give it to them so that they get it wrong. It turns out that getting some things wrong, in fact, makes Duolingo more addictive. Uh, and in fact, that progress bar at the top moves based on our expectation of whether you're going to get something right or wrong. So if we give you something that is above your difficulty level, something that we think you're going get to get wrong, but you get it right, that progress bar goes up a lot because you got something right that we thought you were going to get wrong. But again, if we give you something very difficult and you get it wrong, that progress bar doesn't go down very much because we anyways expected you to get it wrong. <laughs> so we do a lot of very sophisticated things like that to try to keep people as engaged as possible. Uh, now, when we launched Duolingo, it was me and my co-founder Severin, who's a Swiss guy. Uh, neither of us actually knew anything about how to teach languages. I, uh, I learned English at a very early age, and that's about my language learning experience. So. <laughs> When we launched, we didn't know much about, about how to teach languages. Um, so what we decided to do is we decided to go read books about how to best teach languages. We literally read French for Dummies. Uh, we read a bunch of books about how to best teach languages. At some point, we read a book, that, or we, we came across a book that, well, the title of it was amazing, and the book had a really good content. The title was something like, The Best Method to Learn a Language. And it had all kinds of scientific evidence that proved that this really was the best, me the best method to learn a language. So we thought we had struck gold because this was not a very well-known book, and we thought, oh, all we have to do is turn whatever this book says into an app, we're done. This is the best app to learn a language, scientifically proved. This is what we thought. Um, but unfortunately, we pretty quickly came across other books that had very similar titles that completely contradicted this first book, and they also had very good scientific evidence saying that. So at that point, we were confused. I mean, we didn't know what to do, and we were just a couple of engineers trying to come up with a language learning site. We, we had very simple questions, things like, should we teach plurals before adjectives, or adjectives before plurals? And, you know, nobody seemed to be able to give us a definitive answer to that. So what we did is we just launched what we could, and we launched. Fortunately, Duolingo started getting very popular, and after that, we found ourselves in a very fortunate position. Um, we we were in a position where we could actually answer all of the questions that we originally had because we could start experimenting on our users. So for example, nowadays, if we want to figure out whether 
we should teach plurals before adjectives or adjectives before plurals. What we do is we just run an experiment, which is for the next 50,000 people that sign up. For Duolingo, it takes about six hours to get 50,000 new users. So for the next 50,000 people that sign up, to half of them, we teach them plurals before adjectives. To the other half, we teach them adjectives before plurals, and then we measure which ones learn better. And once and for all, we've answered, at least for Duolingo users, it turns out that teaching one way is better than the other. And then we do that, and we just got better at teaching in that one way. So we do this every week. Every week we are running about, I don't know, 50 different experiments. So literally Duolingo every week is getting better and better. And it's because we're experimenting on our users. That didn't sound so good. But we are experimenting on our users, and Duolingo is getting better. Uh, and because of that, um, the City University of New York just did a study, and they found that if you use Duolingo for 34 hours, you uh, can learn the equivalent of one semester of college education by just using this app, and it's completely free. Thank you. Um, now, this is, this, is, um, this is a world map, of course, um, but this is, it's colored by the, we have users everywhere in the world. We have about 150 million users. They are in every single country. Uh, this is colored by the most popular language that is being learned in each of those countries. So, for example, in the United States, that's Spanish. In Canada, that's French. In most of the world, it's English. This makes sense. Um, now, there's a lot of these, you know, most of these make sense, but there's one that's very interesting that struck, struck us as interesting. Uh, hopefully, you can see it. In Sweden, people are learning Swedish. <laughs> that's the most common language learned in Sweden. Now, when we first saw this, we were like, all right, what is going on? Uh, but then we found out, and it turns out this is a, it's pretty interesting. We had actually hadn't realized what was going on here. It turns out these people are learning Swedish, and they are native Arabic speakers. So in Sweden, and this is, we're starting to see this ever in Europe, but you see it more in Sweden. And the reason you see it more in Sweden is because everybody in Sweden knows English, so these people don't need to learn English. Uh, but basically, we're seeing a lot of refugees starting to use Duolingo because it's a completely free way to learn a language, and we're seeing that everywhere across Europe. Um, now, interestingly, you can see here, the main language that people want to learn is English. And this brings me to the last uh, kind of thing that I wanted to, to talk about. Um, and it is, it is a new project that we started um, about a year and a half ago that is, that is related to Duolingo. And it, and it started from emails that we started getting from our users. So our users started saying, hey, um, thank you for teaching me English. Uh, I wasn't able to afford it before, but now I have a problem. I need a certificate that I can speak English because I need to apply to a university or my, my job requires a certificate that I can speak English, etc. And we started getting enough of these emails that we decided to look into this. And what we found was pretty crazy. Um, and it was that... Uh, you know, basically, a lot of people are trying to certify that they know English. In fact, it's about $10 billion a year spent by people certifying that they know English. Uh, you may need to do this for all kinds of reasons. If you apply to a university in the United States or in the UK, for example, and you don't speak English, you need to take a standardized test that proves that you speak English. If you want to get a, a work visa in the UK or in Canada or in many countries, you need to have a standardized test that proves that you know English. Now, these standardized tests um, are, we thought, were really crazy. Uh, first of all, they cost about $250. There's, there's a few of those. One of them is called the TOEFL. Another one's called the IELTS. There's a Cambridge test. They all cost about $250. Uh, in order to take them, you have to go to a testing center. And, you know, that's where you take the test. And because you have to go to a testing center, you have to make an appointment about four weeks in advance. And it takes another four weeks to grade the test. So the whole process takes eight weeks, $250. You have to go somewhere. So that seems pretty annoying, but it's way worse because it turns out that uh, most of these tests are, in de are taken in developing countries. And there, you know, $250, that's a month's salary. The testing center, they're not in every city, so people have to travel. So we decided this was a, an insane way, the same thing that was happening, that $10 billion a year were being spent on this. So we decided to launch our own version of an English test. It's called the Duolingo English Test. And with, with this, the idea is that um, instead of having to take a very expensive test, you can take our test, you can take it from your own home, and you'll get a certificate that actually you speak English. Now, one of the biggest problems we had to solve, you know, we made the test, it's a very good test. Now, we, need to, we needed to solve the problem of cheating. The reason you have to go to a testing center to take a test is to prove that you are not cheating, that you are you and not your cousin. So, we decided to, uh, you know, the way to solve this problem, we wanted to make a test from an app. The way we decided to solve this problem is by actually recording you with your front-facing camera in your phone and on your... Um, your microphone, so actually record everything, and we have a real human watch you take the test while you're taking it from the app. 
And so that works. Uh, and we launched it, and since then, um, as of this year, for example, there are 30 US-based universities that include Yale, Tufts, Notre Dame, um, uh, UCLA, a bunch of other universities that are starting to accept our test, as opposed to the other more expensive tests that prohibit other kinds of people. So we're very happy with this. Thank you. And then the last thing, which I'm... Uh, I'm, I'm done, uh, but the only thing that I wanted to announce, and this is something that was very important to us, and I, I wanted to come here to announce it, is that uh, Duolingo has all kinds of languages. Uh, this is the first time that we are announcing that we are going to teach an African language, so the first language that we're doing is Swahili. And there will be more to come. Uh, next one on, on, uh, on the line for uh, launching in Duolingo is Zulu, so we're, we're going to do that. So, good. Uh, that's it. Thank, thank you very much.